Hello and welcome to this edition of our series on higher education. Today we have a very interesting subject, which is the future of higher education. And we have with us a very esteemed guest, Dr. Sharad Maheshkar, Pro VC of Narsi Monji Institute of Management Studies, one of the premier institutions of India. And uh, we, are like, we are going to discuss, as I said before, the future of education. So we're going to take a lot of different, different questions on that. Good evening, Dr. Maheshkar. Good evening to so you, Ram. My first question to you, sir, before we start. Yes, sir. My first question to you, of course, before we kick off the whole thing is that how have you been comfortable with so far? How, how has the lockdown been treating you? Oh, yes. The lockdown is, uh, you know, uh, making uh, making us work more than what we are in the office. And uh, it's been hectic, but a different life, I should say, altogether. <laughs> yes, sir. So let's let's start this with a very, I mean, a very basic question that post this pandemic, how will universities convince students that their parents and their parents that their campuses are safe? Yeah, Ram, let me first welcome you and thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, and then let me welcome all the viewers, parents and students for this interaction. And these are very important and uh, serious times for uh, careers of students. So this question of uh, how the students and parents will be coming, uh, sending their wards to the campus is a very important question. And this must be lingering in the minds of students and parents. I must say it's a very important question given these times now. Uh, I should mention here that universities and campuses in general have to adapt to the new normal. They have to adapt to the new normal, but then uh, nobody knows what is going to be the new normal. Uh, of course, till we have some solutions, physical distancing, as the prime minister says, Doga Jantar, is the most important preventive measure that should be practiced till we at least find vaccines or treatment. Even after practicing physical distancing, we should practice personal hygiene very religiously, like wearing a mask, protect yourself and others, and so many other things that so many uh, uh, you know, medical public health professionals are uh, mentioning to you. And every university administration will have to prepare for this situation, avoid crowded classrooms, stagger timings, and classroom timings, at least till we flatten and bring to uh, bring the curve down drastically, till we have vaccine and treatment, as I said earlier. The universities will not only have to adopt these measures, but also articulate standard operating procedures for each and every one at the university to follow. And these guidelines should be followed and complied voluntarily. Parents and students have to be assured that these are not only articulated, but practice religiously so that they feel assured and confident that the wards are safe in the university premises and campuses. And unless we rise to this task, we will not protect our students and keep our society safe and secure. Universities have to rise to the occasion and show the path to the society. I'm happy to inform you, for, for all of you, that uh, NMIMS is a classic example of this. Uh, we are in the process of putting in place all these measures. Students and parents are being informed they would like to hear what are the SOPs and other measures taken to see that the students, when they come down to the campus, will be safe right. and secure. Mm -hmm. They need not worry. We are putting in place a very sound system. Great, sir. But, you know, it will still sort of cause some disruption to the, to the system. I mean, it will take yes. some time for it to happen. Yes. So how yes. will this disruption impact, let's say, admissions and placements? Oh, uh, you know, this is a very important question again, because, you know, uh, although we are thinking of starting maybe around June, July, July, middle of July, we will not be starting in the beginning with a face to face mode. We'll be starting with the online delivery for about one, one and a half month till the parents and students feel confident. So that uh, measures we are taking so that the students feel secure and safe by the time they come here. But before I talk about the admissions and placement, I should talk about uh, you know, how the COVID-19 situations will affect placements, of course. But uh, let us look at what is the magnitude of the problem that people are defining. You must have read in se several newspapers and media that governments and global agencies are comparing the situation with the 1920 plague and resulting in a situation, economic situation similar to 2008 or the 1940 recession and deaths and time frames like World War II, World War I or World War II. Even the developed economies, economies are facing a huge challenge as far as the public health preparedness is concerned. Developing economies are feeling the strain more. In that sense, I must say that India has done exceedingly well. 
but the amount of time that we can sustain this stress has reached a yield point. However, the amount of research and innovation that we have witnessed in engineering, pharmacy, and healthcare will keep uh, will help us in finding a solution that too very quickly with several vaccines likely within a year. This is likely to help us recover quickly. In short term, we, in short term, however, we'll have to face the challenge head on. Be efficient, innovative, frugal, and slim. Given this situation, admissions and placements will certainly feel the stress. However, the universities like NMIMS and other reputed institutions, given that they have innovation at their heart, will survive. Let me give a few examples what steps universities have taken. With a lot of technology intrusion in reputed universities, most of them could successfully complete the academic delivery as well as the assessment for 1920 effectively, along with the required quality and integrity. The faculty, leaders, faculty and the leadership at each university uh, have done an excellent job. Now this is being extended to admissions also. For example, at NMIMS, we are conducting an All India Entrance Exam, NPAT 2020, in an online internet-based remotely proctored manner. And mind you, the proctoring is going to be quite rigorous. It is human as well as AI and ML-based proctoring with a well-defined honor code. Several universities are also adopting this approach and measures. Most of the marketing departments, if you look at, of all the universities are restructuring their budgets and making big efforts on connecting with students and parents to social media and other online platforms. These efforts mm -hmm. are showing results. Uncertainty in conduct of other national tests is causing a lot of anxiety. But as, as all of you witnessed yesterday, the uh, JE advance and the NET results are NET tests have been scheduled. But the efforts of the private sector of conducting online tests are helping reducing anxiety and stress in the minds of students and stakeholders. Universities are also thinking of offering payment of fees in installments, given the economic impact that the parents may be feeling. So what happens to admission given all these things? Yes, in spite of the efforts that the higher education sector is taking, there will be some impact on admissions, but the efforts which have been made now will keep the impact to a minimum. And as far as the placements are concerned, most of the placements for the academic year 1920 were completed. However, organizations where students were placed are likely to delay the joining since they will have to also take a pause, take a deep breath and begin slowly and ramp up as fast as possible. So we expect a delay, but most companies as far as placements are concerned have assured that they will honor their commitments. Internship is what got affected the most. The students will therefore lose an opportunity to get valuable exposure and the employers an opportunity to assess potential human resources. The next year of placement will also a bit late in getting off the block. But even the vibrant education sector, given the efforts that they are doing, we are doing, next year placements will be also track a bit delayed. So in summary, I should say that there will be some impact felt on the placement and admissions, but the efforts that have been put right. now, uh, the impact will be minimized. Great, sir. You know, coming, taking off from that last question, yeah. that, you know, even before this pandemic began, there were yeah. arguments being made against campus education. One, the economics does not support it because of rising tuition costs and students' infrastructure. And two, the right. online education model is not just convenient, it is superior because it aims at mastery, not scoring. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, Ram, thank you for this question because, you know, again, this is a very burning issue for the last, uh, at least say, for a decade. And this uh, situation has brought it to the anvil now. A very relevant question. And let me address this in two parts, you know. The first thing is that let us discuss the rising tuition fees for students and infra costs for universities. Face to face, I mean, physical presence in university education is practically unavoidable for many reasons. Amongst many reasons that one can cite, peer to peer learning experience, necessity of hands-on practical sessions in engineering, pharmacy, science, healthcare, and agriculture domains are very right. necessary. You can't avoid that. A professional in this domain needs to have exposure to practical aspects, which is based on laboratory work. And of course, assessment of the knowledge gained thereby ensuring learning outcomes. The infrastructure for this practical exposure has to be modern and relevant. All this has its own cost. Of course, in comparison to this, the online education has its own advantages and disadvantages. Yes, mastery learning as defined by Professor Bloom is a big, big advantage. Uh, opportunity for learning from the best in the world is again another advantage. And along with that is the affordability. But lack of peer learning is one of the biggest disadvantage which digital learning platforms are trying to address. 
I should quote mm -hmm. a petition of Harvard students to their dean, which just appeared in the media recently. Students from Harvard have asked for a partial refund of fees because they could not get the peer-to-peer -peer learning experience, which they thought right. had a big value. The answer to this dilemma, therefore, whether we should have uh, online learning or face-to-face -face learning at campuses, lies in blended learning. To get the best of the two worlds, we should adopt blended learning. Remove the stigma attached to the online learning, especially in India, and embrace it. In fact, this situation should be viewed as an opportunity. Universities like NMIMS, which had recognized the value and importance of this blended mode, blended model early, and introduced learning through online platforms like Coursera, along with Indian platforms like Swayam, will benefit from this uh, opportunity. If you remember, the AICT had also laid down a pathway for this mode of delivery about two years ago. And universities like NMIMS, which saw the future, are reaping benefits of these initiatives. So yes, each of these modes has its advantages and disadvantages. But the blended mode in right proportion is the way forward, I think, Ram. Wonderful. So I think, I mean, I agree that a blended mode is, is what we're looking at in the future. But do you yeah. think that this catalyst was, I mean, this pandemic was a catalyst for this imminent shift? I mean, if you if you look at it, has it, has it made this thing grow faster, this change towards? Yes, Ram, as uh, I mentioned, you, yeah, right, right, right. So yes, Ram, as, as I mentioned in my earlier uh, part of the discussion, uh, this issue was being debated for the last decade or decade and a half now. And this, uh, you know, situation has brought it to the anvil and the forefront of discussion. And at least uh, uh, people are discussing and trying to use and embrace it. This is indeed, uh, yes, the, the pandemic has forced the higher education sector to reorient its strategy and outlook towards online learning. Many universities have completed the last leg in an online mode and are now taking feedback of the experience from faculty as well as students. You look at many surveys now which are available. This feedback will be valuable to assess the efficacy of platforms, enable universities to assess the training needs and plan for the future. I must mention here one interesting thing that we did at NMIMS. We had the Coursera NMIMS partnership, which has been very exemplary in this front of online education. Besides other initiatives, NMIMS faculty was also trained and provided access to the private authoring platform of Coursera which will enable faculty to not only conduct online courses with quizzes and so on, but also assist students from the academic, coming academic year. All such initiatives will enhance the learning experience and mold teachers to engage in a blended online learning. At many universities where innovation is at the heart, the situation has become an opportunity and a stimulus for this transformation. I must say that this situation has been a catalyst to all these changes around. Yes, sir. Looking at another another aspect to this whole education thing, how do you think this pandemic has impacted the future of international education? Uh, yes, again, uh, you know, uh, I had been recently to US and when we were at Purdue, just before the pandemic, uh, we got the lockdown. The universities at even that point of time, somewhere in January and February, were discussing about what's the impact of this on their enrollments and students and the sustainability and so on. This has had a significant effect on developed countries and leading economies like US and Europe, where the public in health infrastructure is being tested and it is showing big gaps. This is bound to affect the image of these countries and continents. In that sense, presence of international students for at least coming two to three years is likely to be affected in US and Europe. This in fact has provided Indian universities a big opportunity to enhance their share of international students at least students who are aspiring for international degrees and exposure. Shifting of the production activities from China to other countries like India or Japan is also one more opportunity which India should grab. This, therefore, is a big time opportunity for Indian higher education sector. And I think they should encash on this to the maximum with the preparedness that they have. Yes, sir. But, you know, given that uh, a lot of students who are who were planning to go abroad will now be looking at Indian universities, do yeah. you think we, the infrastructure here will permit that kind of a uh, pickup? Will, will we be able to pick up the slack? Yeah, there, there are there are uh, there are uh, angularities to this, and there are you know problems of this. But then I must mention here that this is a big opportunity for Indian universities, and especially those universities which had set sight on internationalization long ago. If you look at the rankings, QS or Times or other rankings that we have. Internationalization has been a big drawback for Indian uh, universities. And some of the universities had you know, set sight on internationalization for a long time and they were already preparing for it. For example, at NMIMS, 
the vision of NMIMS is to be globally admired by 2030, globally admired. So consistent mm -hmm. with that vision, our international relations department has been working five years or more very assiduously and put big plans in place. We have had collaboration now with reputed universities like Purdue, Virginia Tech, and Stevens Institute of Technology for finance programs, for analytics programs, and so on. I'm sure other universities which had had a head start in this aspect will take the benefit of this opportunity. But let me mention a few examples of this which are very useful to uh, for all the uh, students and parents to hear about. We have a collaboration with Virginia Tech, which is a glaring example of a de how deep and wide the collaboration can go. It all started with the MTech data science program, which has about 10 courses and a dissertation or a practicum. Now, in these 10 courses with the Virginia Tech collaboration, uh, faculty from Virginia Tech comes down from Virginia Tech to Mumbai and delivers three courses of the 10 courses of the program. And mind you, the faculty members that come down from Virginia Tech to Mumbai are really star performers of VT. They are very good faculty members. This year, for mm -hmm. example, we are initiating three undergraduate programs in collaboration with Virginia Tech, the uh, artificial intelligence program, the cybersecurity program, and the data science program. In this collaboration, uh, Virginia Tech faculty is not only uh, collaborating for curriculum, quality control, uh, delivery, and so on, but it's also nominating several seven faculty members for delivering seven courses for each of these programs. So for AI, for example, in the entire curriculum, seven courses will be delivered by Virginia Tech faculty coming from Virginia Tech over a period of four years. So also for cybersecurity and so also for data science. Besides it, of course, Virginia Tech will be controlling and quality control, uh, looking at the quality control aspects of curriculum de delivery and also faculty training. Moreover, this year we are starting a very unique first of its kind initiative in collaboration with Virginia Tech. And this program is called as NMIMS VT 311 Coordinated Initiative. So once a student enrolls for this program, he will receive three degrees in five years. The BTEC in Computer Science with Data Science Specialization from NMIMS, the BS Cyber Security Program and Analytics Program, which is a STEM program, and MS in Business Administration with Concentration in Business Analytics from the Pamplin School of Business. This coordinated initiative, as I said earlier, will offer three degrees in five years that too at 50% of the cost compared to a student who enrolls for BS and MS program in US for five years. And I must say we are receiving tremendous response for this program. The reason for mentioning this uh, initiative or collaboration with Virginia Tech is that the collaboration runs not only in terms of curriculum or delivering courses, but it can run also in many other aspects like research and coordinated programs, uh, faculty development, faculty training, and so on. And in such programs, uh, we will have delivery while retaining the value at a lower cost. And I think that will be the order of the day. These programs will also involve faculty training, blended learning, as I mentioned earlier, policy changes in terms of credit transfers and assessment and evaluation policies of uh, universities in US, along with laboratory development. Where laboratory development is a very important part for AI and data science and so on. Furthermore, uh, beyond collaboration, given the situation this year, Universities, our international partners who are recommending enrollment at NMIMA since students are not able to join their UG programs. For example, one of the universities in US has come forward and said that since uh, you students are not able to come to uh, their university, they are recommending that they should enroll with NMIMS or an uh, international partner that they have. So this is again a big, a big advantage and they're mentioning that we have reviewed their curricula curriculum, we have reviewed their best practices and we feel that they should recommend the students to these universities. Along with this, they're also advising that students may think of a two plus two dual program once they join the international partner or a PG program or a graduate program, as they say. And once they enroll with the partners, they have a big advantage of switching seamlessly to the international university. Keeping this in mind, also some of the universities are also accepting SAT scores and ACT scores. And this brings in a lot of opportunity and options for students because uh, we are, many, of the, uh, many of the universities and national exams are not yet conducted. So the SAT and ACT scores are available with the students. So in conclusion, I must say that Indian universities are making the most of this opportunity as far as internationalization is concerned, Ram. Yes, sir. I mean, but you know, the fact remains that Nasimonji is among the premier institutions. So it has a reputation. So it's easier for that institution to collaborate with others. What happens yeah. to the other universities? What kind of uh, changes do you think they'll need in terms of infrastructure, policy changes, teacher training, et cetera? Yeah, so, you know, as I told you earlier, 
most of the universities who are reputed i let me say in the top 100 200 or 300 universities in the country have said have said their goals on internationalization and you know they have been for the last 5 10 years trying to collaborate with different universities maybe the universities are not top ranking but they are trying to collaborate with them we have been fortunate because of your status we could get ra- ranking universities ranked universities but everybody in the last 100 200 top universities in the country have been putting emphasis on collaboration and when you talk of collaboration uh, not only uh, you know normal student exchanges and uh, so on it's also de- faculty development it's also about uh, research collaboration and each one of them was doing this in a small way and this if they are done in the small way rigorously in the last 5 years will naturally pay dividends now and all the initiatives now involve faculty development faculty training research conferences on research jointly and these universities 200 to 300 universities in that country will obviously benefit from this efforts which were which were going on to see that we shift up a ranking in qs times higher education uh, higher and higher and these international efforts will you know pay us in good and stay, help us in good state how do you think the government can help get in, get with this initiatives is there, is there something the government can do in terms yes, of the sir. new law ugc thing that's coming in the new things yes. there be what principles should they have yeah so you know uh, i must say ram that the last 5 years the government has really galvanized on this front a lot you know they are taken so, so many initiatives given autonomy to uh, many universities given uh, institution of eminence category to many universities made uh, made regulations which are more uh, more giving more freedom to the universities and once they are have once they are ensuring quality they have a lot of freedom to all these things so the last 5 years uh, and you know have been very important for the higher education sector because so many uh, regulations innovations and freedom that is given to the good universities accredited universities is a landmark thing in the last 5 years and i must say that all all what has been done in 5 years is going to pay now because we have got lot of freedom now we can collaborate with top 200 500 qs ranking universities without lot of uh, you know uh, ties and you know without lot of uh, uh, chains and that is very important for all of us the government has made the effort we will see that paying in the, this coming 2 3 years through so many measures so do you see the do you see the new ugc laws that are likely to come in the new uh, setup do you think all these things will be implemented in the yeah they, they are some of them already implemented in the you know for category 1 autonomy status category 2 yeah. and 3 but furthermore the ugc norm which are going to come up will actually be a catalyst to all these which is happening in the last 5 years and should help indian institutions to go ahead provided they are uh, ensuring quality in education they should help mm-hmm. yeah so the other argument that is being made against the universities per se is that degrees are losing value rapidly yeah. google and facebook have already have a policy that they don't ask for degrees mm-hmm. there is also something called academic inflation because you know a job that yeah. needed a matriculation earlier now needs a bachelor's degree and there's so yeah. many specializations and bdgs that are needed yes that some people are saying that degrees mean nothing that you know it's your contextual education that matters mm-hmm. so how's impact higher campus education and what steps do you think yeah this so in fact this again you know uh, uh, along with the you know what people are what economists are saying that it's brick mortar centers which are important all the very important questions uh, what i must mention here is that you know uh, in spite of being from the higher education sector i should say that the apprehensions of the industry are very valid and i can understand those understand those apprehensions and this is all happening because of lack of connect with the industry and its non participation in the curriculum design content and even beyond it the purpose i uh, will well look at what is the purpose of a degree the purpose of a degree has to be redefined now the aim of higher education is to offer fundamental knowledge expose students to a few domains to give a flavor where the entire domain is moving allowing students to apply the knowledge and gain uh, knowledge uh, gained through internship projects and learn as they do once the curriculum is structured appropriately with the industry support a student can navigate through and the attainment of student outcomes will make him ready for the profession the knowledge in each domain is growing so much that it is difficult to co- even cover the fundamentals of sub domains disruption right. is going to be the order of the day therefore the j- important job of faculty now is to teach students how to self learn continuously learn and then unlearn and relearn 
once this is done degrees will be relevant and have and will have deeper meaning and of course blended learning will play a bigger role in this exercise obviously the percentage of blended learning has to increase in that sense brick and mortar centers will have to re strategize think of certifications micro specializations other elements which will be built up in the degree if this is the only way to make a degree relevant otherwise as you said the apprehensions of the industry are really relevant that uh, answers most of the questions ram So there was a mild disruption. I think I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. There was a minor disruption. It's somebody's Wi-Fi must be giving trouble. Yeah, Next. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Next question that I have for you, sir, is that the economists predict yeah, yeah. that instead of a brick and mortar center for higher centers of learning, there will be higher level of learning, yeah, which means yeah. that you know instead of having a centralized place where people come to study. that there'll be people reaching out the universities will actually be a web from where where students are taught outside the university campuses do you agree yeah in in a sense you know that that is going to be the order of the day but it's not going to be completely out of the out of the campus out of the university it's going to be as i told you blended learning where you know the benefits of both the worlds have to be taken and then you build on that have micro certifications as i said earlier have micro specializations and that will be built in the degree so the uh, economics are right in to some extent but then uh, we will have to have a blended learning model to ensure that you know we uh, have a blended learning so that we uh, use the uh, benefits of both the worlds i cut sir okay hello कनेक्शन गेल का बोल कनेक्शन गेल का बोल कनेक्शन गेल का मत हेलो जाऊन तिथे लाल दिवा ऐकल बघ ना माय गॉड आई थिंक वी आर बॅक कॅन यू हियर मी नाउ सर कॅन यू सी मी नाउ या या आई कैन सी यू नाउ सॉरी इट वाज ऑफलाइन फॉर अ मिनिट या ओके Yes, there seems to be some Wi-Fi issue. It's bound to happen now yeah. because everybody is on the digital thing. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, okay. So the last question before we start taking questions from our viewers, yeah, is that you know that the modern modern education system, for instance, in the US, is undergoing what is being dubbed as a relevance revolution. Yeah. In the sense that while degrees may not become obsolete, people are starting to ask, what exactly did you study, and how is it relevant to my workplace? Are these questions valid? i think these questions are very valid you know because uh, uh, the graduate attributes you know when we start a program we always define something called as a graduate attribute and uh, these graduate attributes are very important and we need to def define redefine revisit these graduate attributes frequently for every profession there is a need to redefine these attributes and visit this very frequently as i said earlier and in all these the professional bodies which have industry representation are continuously engaged in this process so we need to redefine these graduate attributes and look at the program closely and see that these are addressed in the program uh, program outcomes and so on and these initiatives you know we look at the accrediting bodies like abet or aasb or even our nba uh, national board of accreditation uh, uh, body they also look at what are the graduate attributes required over a period of time they address this they try to redefine this these initiatives which you know build in the industry perspective in the accreditation the graduate attributes and the student outcomes they will be helping to keep the education sector especially the higher education sector relevant and this is the only way that we can be relevant to keep relevance in what we learn and ensure that we do not become extinct so relevance is a issue but then the graduate attributes requirements of the industry should percolate down to program outcomes program educational objectives and course outcomes and so on and that is being ensured by all the accrediting bodies very regularly maybe there's a time lag in all these but then this is certainly ensured Uh, as minimal a time gap as possible mm -hmm. so let's take a few questions of the audience yeah. there is gentleman called ashutosh mishra who's a 
I'll put his question at the bottom. He's asking whether in case there are delays in national board and competitive exams like JEE, CAT, etc. Yes. Should we focus on changing our student selection mechanism and criteria? Uh, I I feel yes, we should uh, you know change. But you know this time the time of disruption that we have, you know we don't have the twelfth standard results, we don't have the tenth standard results. The uh, CBSE board has not been able to conduct the entire thing. I felt that the online exam, internet based exam. uh from home of course it had its own problems you know connectivity nationally is not assured students don't have the it infrastructure required students don't have the software support required so these are issues where you know the at the national level it's very difficult to conduct a test but then i think in the future we should you know gear up ourselves and think about solutions which are possible in such disruptions because uh, we are not still through with the covid 19 situation we have to live with it uh and i see that if we don't address these solutions now uh, we will in the future face similar situation so uh, we have to think of what are the ways of having national entrance tests maybe online internet based making it easy for even a person in the village a, stu a student in the village to give a test with his uh, basic smartphone which is there normally in with students and seeing that he is able to give the students with lot of integrity maintaining the honor code these are things right. which we have to think in the future and you know this have to be built in because this is going to be the order of the day henceforth and if we don't uh, learn from this we will uh, fall back mm -hmm. there is another question which is come in from uh, a gentleman called sahir safdar but it's a mostly question that he've already answered but the last part of it you know he's asking whether our online courses the future of higher education can distance learning be on a massive scale be sustainable is it a viable alternative to traditional institutions i think you already touched upon all those yes. but the question that i like here is what challenges could this face what what kind of challenges are there what challenges a does it pose to the university system this online education and what are the challenges that the online education system itself has so yes that's again a very good question you know why we are looking at the rosier side of face and looking at the covid 19 as an opportunity Uh, there are there are always downsides for each of these solutions for example you know i was talking to a professor in us who is advising us on abet and he said that you know even in us uh, this online learning has is bored us and we are delivering on one side but we are not ensuring the learning is happening or no that is one of the most important issues you know what about what happens to learning outcomes and there are ways and means in which the online platforms are treating this and trying to address this but this is one important thing teaching is happening but are we sure of the learning outcomes that is one important thing which we have to face but that is subsequently right now what is happening is uh, there is so much of demand on the connectivity even in now our program you find that uh, you know the small gaps of uh, internet uh, connectivity being uh, a problem so you yes, know sir, we saw that in our in our conversation itself we got interrupted twice yeah so what happens to a student living in a rural setting what happens to the in it infrastructure what happens to the software will he be comfortable or will he feel you know uh disillusion with the entire thing will you have a nausea of all these things so these are very important things you know connectivity uh, accessibility of students across the country not thinking only of cities but also of rural situations where students don't get their normal things in life will they be accessible and i, I we should have uh, you know for this a lot of discussion and deliberation to see that we are able to reach uh, we have the most possible outreach for everybody in the country in the students to prepare otherwise we can just go on talking about online education blended learning but then uh, if a student is not able to access it how does one uh, learn and then further issues will be of connectivity blended learning faculty training and ensuring learning outcomes because you know when we talked about the last phase of this academic year 1920 many of the faculty members have complained that we are not able to ensure the rigor we are not able to ensure you know face to face learning whether it is happening we are not able to ask uh, you know questions to students and see their responses we don't see the faces of students because you know right. when we when we teach uh, when we teach something and the students faces glow that's a good reflection of that what we are giving is being received well this is not happening maybe so the technology required for this the it infrastructure the in, the country's preparedness for the technology has to be improved only then we can go to in a full blast as we say yes sir we have a question from shrutika devan who says that since education abroad will be on hold you will answer that question but this question is interesting because it asks that will domestic colleges like yours actually increase student capacity will you be will you be adding more students i mean in your 
college. No, the, the oh. most important thing is, you know, we are governed by our regulatory norms. So we, we have already applied for some seats. But then, you know, uh, we can't go beyond that unless the statutory bodies make some provisions. But we are taking important steps. You know, we are taking important steps over the entire academic year that we had collaborations with uh, good reputed universities. Now this year, accepting SAT and ACT scores so that students don't have to bother about the national entrance exam or entr entrance exams of different universities. So we have made a lot of efforts. Now, in seats increase is a difficult thing because it's a national issue. And, you know, if you do that, uh, some seats will be, uh, some universities will be uh, addressing their issue. Others, other universities will not get the students. So increasing seats is a difficult thing, but we are trying to address the situation in uh, many ways, like, uh, you know, having SAT accepted, ACT accepted. Uh, we are trying to collaborate. So these are uh, a bouquet of offering that we have to make students uh, comfortable, especially those who are not going abroad. In fact, there are students who have come back from US after spending one or two years and saying that the parents are, you know, not willing to send them again for at least two, three years. So these students also have to be, you know, comforted by saying that we will allow transfer after looking at the equivalence of the learning that they had. So these are a wide issue. Only seats can't be increased, but we will offer several alternatives to them as they come along. Mm -hmm. I will take the last question, sir, because we are running out of time. There's a gentleman okay. called Farhan Ahmed. Okay. Was asking that in the in the case of technical courses as well as in commerce and management disciplines, students have to do internships with the industry. Yes. So how would students be able to fruitfully able to undergo internship when academic institutions are deemed closed due to the lockdown? Basically asking about internships and how that works during the lockdown. So yes, uh, you know, Ram, in the case of uh, the, one of the questions that I talked about admissions placements, I also talked yes. about internships. The internship is a very important component of the entire learning experience because. The students will go to the industry, see how the knowledge is applied there, and maybe come back and see, uh, you know, uh, this uh, how it was applied in the practice. And especially engineering, you know, it's all about theory to practice and back and forth. So these are very important things. This year, especially the internships got the got the maximum impact uh, because they were delayed. A few cases where you know we could afford to have work from home internships, they have done that, but that itself has some limitations. So what happens this year is uh, instead of talking of admission and placement, I felt that internships got the you know impacted the maximum, and the students lost some opportunity. I don't know when they can go back. Some of the universities have you know twisted the entire academic calendar. They will start with the uh, you know academic delivery theory online from June to August maybe, and then go for an internship in uh, August. So th that some of them has done and th some of them have done and twisted the entire academic calendar. But yet this has created a lot of uh, disruption in the entire process because internships after, you know, some theory uh, learning and going back and forth, that will not happen this time. Maybe some of them are given, you know, faculty led projects and live projects, but that has some limitations. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one last question. So I'll ask, yeah. I'll we'll take one from Arvind uh, Moti. Okay. Saying basically, he's asking that what kind of technology innovation solutions will you put forth for the tech solution providers? As in, suppose you want to hold exams and in, in, in allow people to hold exams at home. What kind yeah. of technology yeah. would you need? I'm sure you've already had discussions with technology providers on this. Yes, what would yes. be your idea yes. for that? So you know, uh, this is a very important question, and you know, we are not used this technology for a long time. But then uh, if you look at our entrance test, which has been announced uh, about uh, 10 days ago, 15 days ago, uh, we have we have made this test now online proctored test, internet based test. So what it does is that uh, I'm just mentioning a few important aspects of this test. Yes, so uh, uh, what is done is that when, when the, the student is given some uh, software beforehand, when you want to start the test, the software will be uh, downloaded and you'll start the test through this software. So when you do this, uh, the software will not allow you to switch screens. You have to look at the screen and give the test. That's first right. thing. The software is also uh, based on AI and human proctoring. So the uh, the camera and the uh, webcam and the microphone should be on when you are doing a test. So the camera will pick up the voice and the images rep uh, regularly, maybe after five minutes for 10 seconds, picking, uh, picking up the voice continuously. And there'll be human and AI-based proctoring. So for maybe 15 students, there'll be a human proctor remotely based, and he will monitor all these 15 students. And if he finds that some student is, you know, not uh, adhering to the honor code that we have specified, in terms of say the, you know, the image will be captured earlier, 
and the image of the student who is appearing and the image uh, right now is not matching it will be giving an alarm to the student saying that uh, the same person is not appearing so you have some image processing uh, technology there and then once the test starts uh, if a student is looking by sideways upwards taking some help then you know it uh, it immediately gives an alarm to the student that you are not following the honor code if you, oh, okay. uh, if you continue if you continue to do that you may be placed out of the test if you are if you want to follow the honor code please uh, the test will be stopped pause that time and then you will be warned and then if you if you still continue if you want to continue you have to say okay then you will be going ahead with the test so there will be one or two you know warnings for the students we don't want to see that the students are interrupted continuously but then right. these are made very clear right from the beginning and then when the test starts this will be shown to the students and warnings will come and unless they accept the honor code they will not be allowed to go ahead now this is something new so there will be ai and ml based proctoring so i am proctoring about 20 students 15 students at one time and i am not able to look at all the 15 students each one what is doing so uh, what will be there is that there will be ai based proctoring so suppose one of the student is adopting this unfair means he is warned and uh, the human proctor will get a message that this student is not adopting the honor code or not following the honor code he will be sending a message so this ai and ml based proctoring will be used there will be no uh, no facility to you know take a take this and a mirroring to a screen there will be no facility for this so uh, this is very important ai and ml based technologies at this point of time are so good that you can address all these concerns now there are some concerns and concerns for all of this some students have written to us that you know you are trying to scrutinize you are trying to you know monitor us you are trying to have a surveillance this is not the aim of any 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 of these things the aim of this uh, test is that we want the students coming to our our university nmms university uh, honoring the code that we expect at at many universities Absolutely. like nmms we want that you know zero tolerance policy to unfair practices so we are doing that there is no intention of any of the uh, platforms to you know uh, peep into your uh, computer or surveillance uh, you adopt some surveillance measures or you know uh, uh, siphon your data there is no intention of all this intention is that you want good students coming to our university adopting fair practices and once the honor code is adopted you will have better students and uh, after this as i told you nobody is going to stop the test in between you are going to be warned and this is going to right. be at record in the background so when we finish the test of all the students maybe 30 40 50000 students we will get a list of students who have not uh, not followed the honor code and then we will right. take a decision on this post test see what they have done why they have done this why they should have done this and then we will also take a call on if the uh, you know uh, unfair practice is very severe should we take them at all in our university so Absolutely. it is going to be a very intense system it's going to be a very intense system the intention is not surveillance intention is not to peep into your data intention is not to you know hijack your data uh, intention is to see that you have good students coming to the university and mind you when the students go abroad uh this is one of the most important thing viewed about the students coming from uh, asia especially that they don't follow the honor code and this worry we want to see that at nmms uh, and reputed universities have also adopted this the honor code unfair practices zero tolerance towards this uh, unfair practices great with that we have sort of run out of time thank you dr mayeshkar for a truly stimulating interview i'm sure that you know you answered a lot of questions which were on the minds of a lot of youngsters as well as their parents i do look forward to seeing you again sometime yeah, i mean yeah, thank you and thank I you very only, much i only yes, wish sir. all the students all the best in their careers and uh, don't be anxious uh, there are good things coming in your life universities are planning you know so that you when you come down to the campus you are safe and secure we are trying to see that tests that you have are you know uh, following lot of integrity uh, stay safe and secure utilize this time well and all the best to your careers thank you ram Thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you